this is really my passion is talking to folks and sharing and spreading the love and joy of um, growing and gardening for birds as much as we can, as well as for our families. And I'm going to start out the talk by um, addressing sort of the challenges that birds face. So um, don't turn, don't tune out if the first, you know, 15 minutes makes you feel a little sad. Um, we are going to end on very positive high notes, um, but I am going to kind of lay out where we are at in terms of bird populations and address some of the issues that have been identified um, specifically with a key paper that came out of the lab in 2019. Um, so bear with me um, and we'll get to the good stuff. This is a beautiful little yellow rumped warbler. They're one of my favorites. Um, for those of you who are a warbler lover, they're one of the latest migrants. So we get blessed often with these little ones um, as late as November, sometimes early December. Um, and these are the kind of birds I like to think about when I'm gardening because this little one is still gonna go quite a ways and I want it to be able to come into my yard and have something to consume, to refuel it as it continues on its journey southward. So when I talk about the challenges that birds face, I like to think, I like to have pictures in my mind of what I'm actually focused on growing and, um, and preserving. So many of you are on this call tonight because you love these beautiful, colorful, animated, charismatic creatures, right? They're fascinating. Um, who can't love birds? They're just everywhere and fun. And the good news is that if we really strategically plant in and around our communities, that we can actually help these birds um, and support them through the food resources that we provide. And there's really good, um, things to plant and there's really not good things to plant. So becoming more tuned into what those good choices are and, and the choices that we make in and around our homes is gonna do a wealth of good potentially for birds. And that's what we're after. So uh, in 2019, I alluded to this paper, um, there was a pretty, um, a pretty dark result that came out of some um, research that had been done by two lead researchers at the lab, where we found, and, and the researchers themselves were surprised by this result. They crunched data from over 50 years and were able to, to put their finger on the pulse that we've lost almost 3 billion birds since 1970. Some populations have gained, there's been net gain, there's been some gains, but the net loss has been tremendous. And um, this is the paper for those of you that may want to go back and, and reference it. It, it was uh, titled The Decline of the North American Aviafauna. And Rosenberg, who's since retired, um, and Dockert are the, were the two leads. And um, this was, this was a, um, it was exciting to be able to put a paper like this together, but it was very depressing for folks in the lab to realize that we were in this state. We didn't really realize that it was as bad as it was, so to speak. And so the lab and Audubon and many other bird conservation organizations are really trying to get their finger on the pulse of, of what we can do about it. And the paper was really helpful because it laid out some really key um, reasons for why we're seeing bird declines, right? We need to know why in order to hopefully correct the ship and bend the curve on our population losses. And this is a big one, probably not a surprise to all of you. De deforestation um, is a huge issue with, with uh, bird, bird habitat, right? The more we cut down, the more those, those birds that depend on the forests suffer. Um, a specific species in the boreal forests that we have seen rapid declines in, um, nine out of 10 lost since 1970. This is one of my favorite winter migrants. We often get them down here where I live. I'm not too far from you all but I'm west um, during an eruption year. Um, and they're just beautiful and they're running out of habitat uh, because their forests are being uh, cut down, their foraging and nesting habitat is being lost. We're also seeing agricultural intensification um, really causing a problem for various birds, but specifically insectivores, right? Birds that really require insects for um, all times of the year. Some birds only consume insects mostly in the uh, nesting season, but there's a lot of birds that consume insects year round, um, meadow larks being one of them. And we've lost three and four since 1970. I have a personal um, sad story. I used to see these all the time when I moved to my region about 14 years ago and I have not been able to find one in my fields in the last three or four years. I intensely um, farm but I farm in such a way to preserve their habitat and I still am not seeing them because a lot of the farms around me don't don't do the practices that I do. So we're starting to see a lot of our meadow species decline as well. They don't have enough food to eat really is what it comes down to when you kind of create these large monocultures. Um, they don't have enough diversity in insects and so they start to struggle to find enough food to eat. 
So one of the immediate things that we can all do, regardless of how much property we have, is we can be really strategic in what kind of agriculture we support. Um, and supporting local farmers like this uh, woman here who's engaged in some really intense agriculture, but you can see behind her that she has this really um, preserved habitat right there next to her farm. And this is a strategic choice that a lot of local farmers make. And they make it for a smart reason. I am one of them. I, I grow for my family and I also uh, support two other families with the food that I grow on my property. And I intentionally plant uh, plant and maintain habitat because the, the birds keep the insect populations down. It's a beautiful thing if we embrace our environment and, and work with biodiversity in and around our community, we actually see a, a great result. So supporting local farmers, if you can't grow the food yourself, for example, is a great way to really support birds in a, in a very direct way. Pesticide exposure is also huge um, for some of the same reasons as having a hard time um, in monoculture communities for insectivores. Those pesticides um, not only get into the food source and then potentially can, you know, contaminate birds and expose birds to pesticides, but it eliminates the amount of insects that are available. And so pesticides, obviously, depending on what they're targeting, will often kill insects and then those birds can't find enough insects. So we've lost a lot of swine follows um, have been hugely um, impacted. Swifts have been hugely impacted um, by pesticide application use in, in very large amounts. So an immediate action step that can we can take that really does have impact um, is to really try to support, again, local farmers and specifically people that are growing organically. And most local farmers are pretty organic, whether they're certified or not. Um, those of you that uh, have farmer's markets, I can almost guarantee that probably at least 70% of the people, maybe even more, are growing food without using any kind of toxic pesticides. Um, so that's the, the way to go. And if you are gro a grocery store shopper, then looking for that organic label is a great action step that you can take to support birds. And then obviously we all know that development is huge. Um, the more land that we take away from, um, from its sort of natural habitat, the more all biodiversity struggles. Um, and we build, you know, infrastructure that, that if we don't put back in native plants and so forth, that the birds will have a very hard time foraging. Um, there's also a huge impact that I'm going to talk about in terms of these buildings themselves. And uh, migratory birds are one of the biggest sufferers when we put up a bunch of infrastructure because they are moving um, from point A to point B. Often that journey is quite big. They have to cover a lot of distance. They have to stop in many cities or many areas to re refuel and resupply. And um, it's a very hard and arduous journey. And some Sometimes they have a hard time finding what they're looking for, and sometimes they become disoriented in that journey. Windows are a huge killer of birds, about a billion birds a year approximately, we estimate. And one of the reasons why is because birds see very similarly to us. So if you look up at this and see beautiful clouds in what looks like the sky, that's what they see too. And that's one of the reasons why they collide with buildings is because they see like we do. And if it looks like a tree or a cloud, they're going to think it's safe and they'll head right into it. Um, one of the things that people don't realize is that city lights um, are what birds get attracted to them because I'm going to show you in another couple slides, most birds migrate at nighttime. And so what happens is when they're flying over, this looks like a very appealing place, all this light, bright energy. And so the birds drop down into the cities at nighttime and maybe they find a tree or a shrub and they hunker on down. And then the next morning, Oops, I guess I can't go back to that slide. Yes, I can. Um, the next morning they wake up and they go, okay, I'm going to continue on my journey. They look up, they look around, they think, oh, there's the sky, I'm heading into it. And then they hit a window. So it's really the light at night that pulls birds into our cities. And then they become disoriented the next day when they're trying to get out and continue on their migration. And I love this visual because it gives you a, a sense of kind of where birds migrate. A lot of people ask why waterfowl don't collide, why we don't find as many. And one of the main reasons is because they, they migrate higher. Um, and so they miss a lot of the infrastructure that, that um, they possibly could, could interact with. Our buildings um, kill more songbirds because they migrate 
quite lower. And you can see here that, that our residences do play a part in this. It's not as much as say a communication tower um, or the major city buildings, but it's, it's 253 million. That's no small amount. So even though we may not be able to convince our cities to turn their lights off, we could actually be doing things in and around our homes to help these migratory birds um, migrate. And so this really is applicable all, all times of the year, but it's particularly critical during peak migration time, which is in the spring and the summer. And on the East Coast, we generally have a bit of a, a bigger, more robust migration in the fall. The birds kind of come down our, um, our migration routes a little bit more in the fall. So, but both times of the year, it's really important. And really between 11 to 6 p.m., during migration time, we could be doing things. So turning off our lights, dimming our lights as much as possible, drawing our blinds, just kind of getting rid of that light so the birds aren't being kind of lured in by the light time. Um, and then leaving, make, making sure that your, your lights are actually off at night, right? So this is great for those of us that live and work um, in the cities because we can really have an impact by turning those lights off. And then floodlights are a huge attractant to birds. So turning them off, dimming them, making sure you have hoods on them that face down on your property. Um, and then motion sensors are brilliant because then you really don't have constant light. It just kind of turns on and off when, it's, um, when something moves under it. So these are all things that we can be doing in and around our homes and, and offices to help migratory birds. We also can be protecting our windows. And this is a, a relatively you know, easy reach for most of us. It could be as simple as, uh, I love this picture, sticky notes in a window, um, creating an image there that, that throws off that, uh, that view that the birds might have. Um, temper paint's really fun. For those of you that may have children or grandchildren, it's really fun to paint the windows together as, a, as an activity. I have a, a little one and we like to do that sometimes together. Decals are another option that do help and then we can get into stuff that's a little bit more expensive and sophisticated, but works as well. So taping or Zen blinds um, that helps to, um, or, or um, blinds on the outside of our windows that can help to detour uh, birds as well. So again, migration time, it's critical for these kinds of things, but you certainly um, can do it year round too, if you would prefer to keep your windows protected, even for our resident populations. And then while this can be one of the um, hardest ones to sort of talk about at the lab, we get a lot of um, interesting dialogue when we talk about cats, but we would be um, failing to do our job if we didn't bring this up. But free roaming cats are, are predators. They're predators we introduce into our environments. And there is no doubt that they're killing birds. They kill about 2.4 billion every year. Um, and that's a big number. Um, and it adds up quite quickly. This was an image that I picked up uh, recently when I was scanning Macaulay Library, and it just sort of sent a little shiver down my back. This is in, um, in Ohio on the Erie Canal, and this cat just looks determined. Uh, and I'm a little scared for those ducks. And this is the reality, right? The predator, uh, cats are beautiful, wonderful creatures, um, but they do hunt and kill. That's just a part of, of what they do. But uh, we can kind of have our cake and eat it too. Um, I like to talk about catios as being the perfect sort of um, solution to this problem. Cats do like to be outside, um, so let's let them be outside, but in a way that protects our birds. So you can be as simple as just a carrier outside a window to something that maybe pushes off of a window or maybe your porch, or I know people that have designed very sophisticated catios. Um, so this is a way to sort of uh, allow both the birds to be safe and to also um, keep our, bird, our cats happy and safe and being able to roll in the sunshine. There is no doubt that climate change is affecting birds and is a challenge for them for lots of different reasons, right? This can throw off their migration. Um, their habitat is often threatened, especially when we see big floods and fires and air pollution problems. So there is no doubt that climate change is putting a lot of pressure on birds. And this picture, while incredibly sweet, also makes me you know, take a breath uh, because tree swallows don't generally like to be in the snow. Um, this flock happened to get caught um, and they're hunkered down together. Um, they'll be able to survive a couple of days, but as you all probably know, these are insect eaters. Insects generally don't like the snow, so these little birds need to get somewhere where they're going to be able to get um, food. And this is happening more and more often, that birds are getting caught in these strange um, weather events, um, and they're being imp impacted. You may have heard um, in, uh, it, it happened actually in 2019 and 2020, 
there was some weird falling out literally of birds from the sky. I actually heard some reports about this happening this year too. Um, and they didn't know what was happening. This happened in the Southwest and it took some time for them to be able to put the pieces together, but it was kind of a lot of climatic pressures that happened all at once, weather patterns that shifted last minute. The um, there were wildfires that were happening out in, in the West, in California, um, Colorado. It was throwing birds off of their migration route because they were trying to get away from some of the um, smoke. And then they came into the Southwest and there was a cold front, a very strange weather snap that happened. And so there was this cold front that came in in an area where they were anticipating being able to, to stop down and refuel. They could not find enough food. And so these birds literally starved. Um, and one of the reasons they fell out of the sky is because they didn't have enough food. They were in the middle of their big migration. They had to be sort of thrown off their normal course and then they experienced this cold weather and then they couldn't forage and it led to real big problems, mostly with warblers and um, swifts and swallows and so forth. Again, a lot of the insect population. So there is no doubt um, that climate change is, is a big uh, pressure for birds. There's good news, however. Um, and a lot of that good news has to do with us humans. Big surprise there in terms of our, our choices that we're making. Waterfowl have actually gained. This is um, one of the species that we have not lost. We have actually gained in our water po a waterfowl population. Wood ducks, for those of you that maybe have ponds in and around your communities, one of my favorites. They're just stunning birds. Um, and their populations are rising along with a lot of other waterfowl. And the reason why is because we have embraced the importance of wetlands. And there has been aggressive wetland conservation in the last um, decade um, and a little bit more than that. And so we're recognizing the importance that wetlands play as buffers, as habitat um, to create healthy ecosystems. And so not too surprising, the birds have come and they've followed and we've been able to see a rebound. We've also seen a great rebound in woodpecker populations. This is another one where we haven't lost, we've actually gained, which is wonderful news. Um, woodpeckers, as you all know, really need, um, need habitat in forests where they can forage for insects. We have changed our forestry practices, um, mostly post 1950. And instead of sort of taking all of the quote unquote dead trees out of our forests, our state and our federal lands, we're leaving them because we see them as ecologically valuable. The woodpeckers do too, and the woodpeckers have been able to continue to thrive instead of losing their 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 trees that, that were dead but still useful for foraging and nesting. They've been able to um, experience population rises. So all of this hopefully makes us feel like though there is declines, there is the potential for us to bend this curve if we continue to make better choices um, with what we're doing for birds. And for me, this is the most hopeful because this is something we can all do. We don't need um, anybody else um, unless, of course, we live in maybe an apartment complex and then we need to get the local um, landscapers on board with this idea. But if we have property, even if it's just a porch or a patio or a small yard, we can be planting things to really help birds. And this is a picture from my second story of one section of my property. My gardens are not real old. Um, I moved to this property in 2017 and really started to create my gardens in 2018. So a lot of them are quite young, but they're all very already robust and, and continuing to be so. And what I like to do is I like to interplant my vegetables with flowers. So there's, so there's vegetable raised beds here. And then I like to surround it by a lot of pollinator habitat. Um, and then I don't have many of my shrub gardens pictured here, but on the other side of my property, I have a lot of shrub gardens. And this is something we all can be doing. And there's scientific evidence that, that says it's a good choice. Um, this was a really great paper that came out in 2020 where they were able to measure the scat, the seeds in the bird scat or bird poop. Um, and they were able to see, particularly with hermit thrushes, that in an area that had abundant invasive species like the Rosa multiflora that, he, that the birds perched on here with other things, other native shrubs, that the, th the thrush would go and prefer the native shrubs. And they were able to, to measure this, to literally measure this. This was done, this was research, excuse me, done in Massachusetts. So there is growing and mounting evidence that um, birds are intelligent and they are looking for the native plants um, for their foraging habitat as much as possible. This is another uh, angle or section of my gardens. I like to show this because um, this is an early spring or early, well, late spring, early summer. I am not a purist. So I like my irises and my gladiolas and my other um, flowering beauties. Um, but I try to pr prefer and preference natives as much as possible. And I have heard, though I don't know of any solid scientific paper that says this, but um, 
aim for about 75%. If you can aim for about 75, 75% native, that gives you 25% wiggle room, which is what I try to um, lean towards in my gardening. And this is kind of the same section of the garden, but a little bit later in summer where some of the um, bee balm is flowering, the yarrows, and there's some goldenrods, um, and this uh, coreopsis in front is a native, um, a native hybrid. So we can do this, anybody can do this, and this native habitat is critical for birds. There's good news too, that native planting is super easy to do. For those of you that have gardens and do this, I'm sure you can be a testament to how uh, easy plants grow if they're in an, a region that they're used to growing. And what's beautiful is those plants develop sort of a harmony with the other wildlife and they're providing the nectar and the seeds and the fruit at the time of year that the animals that live there need it. So there's a very tight symbiotic relationship between native plants and the wildlife. And a lot of those food resources are designed to feed the migrants and the residents, right? So residents and migrants are going to benefit from this and there is some signs that um, birds and bees and butterflies use plants for medicinal reasons. So I'll show you a plant in a couple of slides that, that there's been research from a researcher in University of Vermont um, that bees actually feed on this particular flower when they're having a fungicide infection. And so animals are smart. Again, they're going to use the resources that they are used to, that they've evolved with, um, to help with their migrations, to combat illness, et cetera, et cetera. But arguably the most important reason is because all of these native plants provide hosts, hosts habitat for um, moths and butterflies that lay caterpillars. And uh, 90, about 98% of our North American songbirds feed their, their offspring insects, um, specifically moths and caterpillar larvae. Um, if they don't have the amount of caterpillar larvae that or the larvae in the form of caterpillars to feed their young they're going to have a hard time raising young and so here's a beautiful uh, baltimore oriole that's probably taken a little morsel back to um, its nesting uh nesting uh back to its nest of young and this is uh, kind of a conservative number. Those of you who are interested in this topic have probably heard or uh, read or watched Doug Ptolemy. This is coming out of his research where he specifically has focused on chickadees. Um, and he has estimated with his research that a single pair of chickadees needs about 7,500 caterpillars to raise one clutch of young. And those of you with nest boxes probably know that chickadees can sometimes have up to three clutches um, in a really good year, maybe even four right they're going to have as many as they can so multiply that out and that is a lot of caterpillars if we don't have the habitat for the moths and butterflies we're not going to have those caterpillars and i've actually seen doug's numbers go up to nine thousand on this so 75 is kind of a conservative effort, uh, estimate Here's a beautiful um, butterfly that I am happy to report since I have planted for it. It has come, um, meaning that it has really specific ecological needs. It's a Baltimore checkered spot. It is nectaring here on milkweed. Um, many of you probably know milkweed's critical for monarchs. Um, it also provides nectar for other plants. This butterfly, however, will not lay its eggs on milkweed. So though it will nectar on lots of different plants, it needs this plant, um, a turtle head, and they, this comes in pink or, or white. This is white turtle head. It needs this plant in order to lay its eggs. Um, and if it can't find this plant, it may be able to nectar and live, but it may struggle to lay any eggs and thus, thus have those eggs turn into caterpillars. This is also the plant that bees have been found by a researcher in Vermont to utilize when they're having a fungicide infection. So really amazing. These, these tight relationships um, are deep and interconnected and the wildlife need the plants and arguably the plants need the wildlife life as well. Here's a sweet little chickadee on an oak species. And again, Doug Ptolemy's work, if you have not checked it out, I highly recommend reading these two books. In particular, these are his two most recent books. Um, and oak species are, are his go-to. It has been found that they support the most biodiversity really anywhere um, that they grow in, in North America. And it is estimated that they can support over 4,000 different types of, of um, animals. So this is insects, birds, um, small mammals, um, oaks are a go-to. So if you are considering making changes to your property, 
thinking about trying to incorporate oaks in some capacity if you don't have them already will go a long way to support a lot of biodiversity and i realize not everybody can plant trees right we don't always have that um, capacity there are some smaller um, like scrub oak um, chinkapin oaks that um, are often found actually along the coast or near the coast that might be better choices that are more shrub like in their growth and now I want to um, go through a series of pictures to show some specific species for those of you that maybe are on this call because you're kind of taking notes about um, specific plants that you might want to consider adding if you don't already have them. This is one of my favorites and many of you probably love this as well because it's one of the first flowering plants in our region. And most of the plants I'm going to show you tonight that you guys are east of me are are, are very likely native to your area. Um, I'm going to give you some resources at the end so you can cross-reference that, but most of these should grow natively in your area. And this is common serviceberry, Juneberry, um, it go, goes by a couple of different names. And a lot of people um, don't realize the reason why this is so important is because those flowers are one of the first bloomers and uh, beautiful little birds like this sweet house wren um, that's coming up from the south and, and doing a migration is going to need some food when it gets here. There's no berries on this plant yet, but there are insects that are going to be drawn to these flowers early in the season. And so they'll often land on these branches and they'll they'll watch and, and they're actually foraging. They're trying to find the insects that are that are eating the flowers. So early blooming plants, um, whether it be small trees like this species or shrubs or flowers are really critical um, for birds. This is a shrub um, that I also love and plant. I plant mostly the purple version of the red um, elderberry. This is a Swainson's thrush um, gorging out. Um, shrub, uh, shrubs that have berries are really important for migrants. Um, I'm not sure how many of you grow elderberry, but I have to compete with the birds to make sure that I actually get some of these berries. Um, the red ones I don't grow, but the purple ones are um, are very high in antioxidants and I make some, some medicine for my family to get through the winter um, because it's really high in those nutrition, that nutrient level and that the birds know this too. And they often will gorge out on these right as they're kind of moving through and or preparing for migration. Really a wonderful shrub, red elderberry can grow quite big and abundant depending on the species you're growing. So you wanna give this plant a, a, some, some room to breathe. This is another one of my favorites. I have a whole shrub garden filled with um, dogwoods. Um, again, a wonderful, relatively early flowering plant. So it supports lots of butterflies and moths and, and provides um, uh, leaves for those species to lay their eggs on. And then they produce these beautiful red, or uh, well, the stems are red all year, which is lovely, but they produce these beautiful white berries um, that the birds love. They do not last long on my dogwoods. They are stripped clean pretty quickly by things like robins and thrushes. Um, so another lovely species to add um, to your property. Any kind of a viburnum is a go, is a win. Um, viburnums also have an early flower and they generally produce a lovely um, fruit. Uh, of all different shades, this particular one produces a purple fruit. I have um, American cranberry is its common name. I stick to common names mostly because um, I came into botany through birds um, and through habitat. So I use common names more than the Latin, but the Latin is provided there if you need it for, for going to your nurseries. Um, I, I grow American cranberry. It produces a beautiful red um, fruit that the waxwings love, um, that the thrushes will consume right before migration. So um, any kind of a viburnum species that you can find that's native will be helpful for the birds. And this is one of my personal favorites because like the weather that we are about to experience, um, these shrubs hold their fruit and like fine wine, they get more flavorful. So these are one of the last things that birds will actually eat in, um, in even right now. I still have some on my shrubs that they're starting to slowly go, but, but they're still there. As they freeze and thaw, freeze and thaw, they get sweeter. This is winterberry. Um, and I have had big flocks of cedar waxwings land and just to be happy as happy as clams <laughs> to be consuming these winter berries in the middle of a of a cold snap um, or winter storm. Moving into more of the herbaceous plants. Um, this is one of the beautiful early bloomers around here. If you love hummingbirds, this is one that they will seek out uh, when they move up this way from their wintering grounds. This is Eastern Red Columbine. 
Columbine is one of the plants that's highly hybridized. And I'm going to talk a little bit about um, the hybridization of native plants. So as much as possible, try to find this version. It's sort of a salmon colored petal with that yellow center. Um, it is the Eastern, um, Eastern red Columbine. You probably can get lots of different Columbines at your local centers. They may or may not provide the uh, same amount of ecological benefit to the wildlife. So try to stick with the natives when you can. Um, other ones that will attract and support butterflies that are beautiful additions to the garden are the Oswego tea or bee balm, a lovely one. This is really a midsummer or early to midsummer flowering plant. And then cardinal flower is one of my favorite later summer sometimes as early as early uh, fall, um, sometimes through the end of August or so, I will still have it flowering, really loves wet. So if you have a real wet garden or a wet space, um, or if you have a rain garden, cardinal flower is a great addition, likes to have wet feet, it's very happy that way. And literally, I don't feed um, hummingbirds with a feeder, but I will move my lawn chair and sit by this plant, um, not too close, um, but close enough that I can see the hummingbird coming in and out and in and out. They love this plant and they will be readily um, readily seen um, if you have those those species on your property. Uh, Echinacea is another plant that is very popular. Um, it produces really lovely dense seed heads for, for species like the American goldfinch. They are an exception to that 98% statistic that I gave you. They will actually feed their young seeds. Um, and they're one of the later uh, feeders, They or later nesters. They often will late into July and August sometimes. And one of the reasons is because they need the seeds, right? So they're waiting for all of the plants to have seed heads so that they can consume them and give them to, to their young. So coneflower is, um, is popular. Uh, I have seen some people recently talking about being a little bit nervous about coneflower. And one of the reasons is because it is highly hybridized. So I'm gonna talk about that. Um, this is an example of a uh, hybridized uh, echinacea called mac and cheese. What they're doing with echinacea and other plants is that they're breeding them for certain characteristics. So maybe instead of fuchsia or pink petals, we want bright yellow ones. Or instead of the plant being only three feet high, we want it to be six feet high. Um, and so what we what a lot of um, botanical uh, places will do is that they'll breed um, native ours for particular characteristics. And this the evidence is still being gathered on this. But there's preliminary evidence that shows if you look at individual species, some species don't actually provide the same ecological um, benefit as the original true wild type native. Um, and so sometimes when we breed these plants, certain values, whether it be the nectar load or the seed quality or the leaf texture, isn't as helpful for the birds and insects. And so it's really important if you want to do as much as you can for wildlife, try to find true wild type natives. Um, and I'm gonna give some resources to help you with that process. A couple more great uh, plants to consider. This is false sunflower. This gets quite big. Um, so this give this one a lot of room. It's lovely. It is it is going to be covered in native bees all summer long and um, and will feed lots of butterflies and um, and moths as well. So this is a great addition, as is this one. Joe Pieweed produces both of these larger tall growing shrubs produce great seed heads for the birds. Um, I don't cut my seed heads back at all. I leave them, they're still standing as we speak so that birds can, can readily use them in the winter time when they need them. Speaking of migrants, um, goldenrod is actually incredibly important for migrants, similarly to the service berry or Juneberry that I showed, but in the opposite end of the season, in the fall, goldenrod and asters are important for insects, late season insects. The insects need them for the nectar, and then the birds will land and actually forage on, on both the insects and, and sometimes the seeds, depending on the species. So this warbler is taking a little break, probably trying to scope out a little insect snack um, before it continues on. And goldenrod can be one that people get very nervous to plant, because it is a pretty aggressive um, plant, but not all species are. So zigzag goldenrod is a wonderful one. Um, for those of you that uh, want to plant goldenrod, it only gets about mm, two to three feet tall. Um, it can go in sun or shade. It won't spread, it won't go crazy, but it does provide the same kind of late season. There's another one called gray goldenrod that's similar. That one needs to be in the sunshine, but it won't go crazy. Um, it will stay relatively short and um, feed a lot of wildlife. 
uh, similar to the goldenrod are the asters. These are one of the latest seizing, uh, latest flowering and seeding plants in our region. Um, cardinals will eat the seeds, um, butterflies and um, bees will be drawn to nectaring on this plant. So a really powerhouse for natives. And then getting into just sort of some bigger general concepts. Um, this is a garden design that I worked on when we were doing with Habitat Network when we were doing some garden design recommendations. And I kind of have nailed it down to the, these three words when I'm when I'm thinking about gardening, and encouraging people to garden is really try to garden diverse. So lots of different species, grow those species dense or close together. You could probably see that in a couple of the pictures that I shared with you and then try to create layers in your garden. And a lot of people don't realize why layers are important. So I'll take a minute to talk about that. This particular person gave us this shot of their property and said, I want a garden to fill in this space. So you can see by the picture they gave us, they have lots of trees. We're not missing trees in, in this particular area, but we are missing some middle story and some low story and some ground cover. And so when we designed this addition, that's what we recommended. Let's fill in this middle story so we can, you probably have plenty of habitat for warblers, right? They like to be at the top of the trees and, and foraging around. But what about sort of those middle stories, those, those cardinal those thrushes that might be wanting to look for resources in the middle story. And then what about our ground species, like maybe our juncos um, and robins, right? So providing these layers to our gardens provides ample foraging for different types of species of birds, which is what, what we're really going for. So dense, diverse, and layered is sort of my theme there. And hopefully many of you are, are listening to this and going, okay, this is great, but how? Like, where, where do I live? What should I be planting? So I wanna give you some resources for that. Up in the corner here, I'm gonna have the websites um, and I'm happy to send these to Anne if she would like to send them out in an email to you all, but um, pollinator.org is where um, where you can find your eco region. And you know, if you look here at New York State, just within our own state, we have lots of eco regions. There's five or six different eco regions. And I actually kind of might be in a little bit of a diff different eco region than those of you that are over here. So knowing where your eco region is, is sort of the first step. And this is different from planting zones. Planting zones are helpful because they can tell us when plants could survive the temperatures um, that are, are most common in those areas, but it doesn't give us more specific information about the, the wildlife, for example, that might be living in that area. So ecoregions gets a little more focused and fine-tuned than just planting zones. And what's neat about these guides is you can um, get on their website. Uh, these, this works for the United States or Canada. You can type your zip code in here and press return and you get these beautiful 20 page um, PDFs that you can download um, and just review, or you can also print it and keep a copy of it. Um, really beautiful. It gives you um, overviews of the different wildlife in your area and then very, very specific plants, their bloom time, their color, um, who they're going to benefit in terms of bees, butterflies, and birds. So I highly recommend these guides. If you haven't explored them already, they give you a wealth of information. And applaud to Audubon. You also have an incredible tool that I highly recommend and always recommend to people, the Native Plant Database. And um, what's really neat about this tool is there's local resources available. So not only can you look up plants and figure out what birds might be benefiting those plants, but you can get a, a list of nurseries in and around your area. Um, you sometimes can get linked right to someplace you can buy it and order it online. Um, and so this is a great tool for not only knowing what kind of birds you will be attracting um, when you grow those. This is the um, the service berry or the June berry that I was showing there with a the house rent at the beginning um, and witch hazel. So these are the kinds of birds that you're going to benefit if you plant this and then it gives you really good ideas about where you might be able to get those plants. Now I always recommend that you call nurseries ahead of time um, and ask the questions so you don't just show up and, and say, oh, they only have a couple plants, right? So ask them what they carry, ask them if they're true wild type natives or if they are hybrids or native ours. Um, so ask those kinds of questions because we as consumers have power. And if enough nurseries are getting enough of these inquiries, they're going to source native um, because they're going to see that there's a demand. So, so make those phone calls and interrogate your, um, your local nurseries.
For those of you that are already deep into gardening, um, I highly recommend this activity. And again, I can send a, um, a PDF to Anne if, if you all are interested. This is what's called a planting palette. And I did this for my property and I found this kind of gaping hole in my March, April um, uh, garden. There was basically not enough, not enough resources to, to support birds and, and other wildlife. And I realized I needed to fill that hole with, with some early blooming um, plants. And so I'll walk you through what this is a little bit. On the left here, we have the species of the wildlife that these different plants can support, um, whether they're trees, shrubs, uh, uh, or ground covers and flowers, their common name, their scientific name, and then their bloom or fruit time is here in the middle. And then if you're really interested in color dynamic, you can color out this and, you know, realize, hey, I have a lot of yellows and red, but mm, I don't have any purple or blue or whatever other color you would like. So having a sense of your color palette and then what it supports. So we'll just walk through this a little bit more zoomed in. So that garden that I showed you the picture of with the dense, diverse, and layered, these are the plants that we recommended. Um, so you can see the common names here and the different kinds of butterflies and bees and even salamanders are going to benefit from, from some of those ground covers because it'll provide some moisture and holes where they can hang out. Um, and then in the middle here, you can see we have a pretty good spread. So the lighter lavender are your flowers. And then as it darkens, that's when those flowers turn into fruit. And then as it gets continuously dark, it's fruit. And then the brown are seeds. So dry seed heads that you would be providing with those different species. And then you can see on the other side of the, cur of the um, graph, you have the colors, what you're supporting, and then the size, how big those plants are gonna get, which is really important. Anybody who does native plant gardening knows that those plants fill in and they fill in fast. So knowing how big things are, knowing when you kind of need to thin things or dig some stuff out and give it to neighbors is also very helpful. So I highly recommend a planting palette um, for those of you that maybe are already deep into this and you're like, you know, I, I don't actually have a sense of how much I'm growing. It's kind of fun. There's a, a metric here on the bottom so you can kind of quantify how many plants have a bloom, um, how many plants are producing seeds and so forth. So you can really start to do some metrics on, on how much um, wildlife you're supporting with your gardens. And then a, uh, another tool that's really lovely, again, I recommend this more for those of you that are maybe getting deep into this and you, you find like myself, I found that I needed some early flowering plants. And so the Lady Bird Johnson Wildflower Center, this is the URL up here, um, you can get very focused in your database searching. And it's, it's a very beautiful native database um, platform. And you can just type in viburnum. As you can see, there's lots of species. But what's more important is you can get down to the real ecological kind of pocket on your property you're trying to fill. So let's say you have shade and it's dry, right? And so you can kind of click on these and you can get very specific recommendations of plants that then you can take that information and either try to find them at your nurseries or, you know, see if you need to special order them or so forth. But this is a really good one. I've used this a lot for filling in kind of specialty needs that I have on my property um, and getting really focused plant recommendations. And so finally, hopefully I'm encouraging or inspiring you all to, um, to start to pay more attention to our properties, right? And I know many of you are birders, so uh, you probably already know the answer to this question, but those of you who maybe are newer to birding um, and birding tools, um, this might be a question that you're asking. And a lot of times when we first start paying attention to the birds that we're sharing our properties with, we kind of have these short little descriptions. So it was kind of small, it had a stripe, uh, maybe it had a, stop, a patch on the back of its head, Paying attention to those visual cues is one of the things that we kind of um, get hooked on first with birds. And uh, I want to just give you a couple of tool ideas. Merlin, for those of you that did the, that did the GBBC, you probably um, saw a lot of this tool. Um, maybe you tried it, maybe you didn't, but it's a great tool. I highly recommend this for um, specifically beginning birders who are just kind of getting their 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 um, binoculars wet so to speak um, and learning some new birds but it's a very simple tool it's a clean tool if you have a smartphone it works on it if you don't have a smartphone which i actually am not a smartphone user i know that's very taboo um, in my position but i i use merlin on my computer um, so you can you can have a computer version if you're not a smartphone user but 
I want to show you how it works for those of you that are not as familiar. So let's see, you see this red streak of beauty um, pass by. These one, these particular birds won't be here for a little while, but let's say, you know, you're down in, in Texas or Mexico and you see this red, red streak land and you go, wow, I want to know what that is. You can open Merlin and you will tell the, the tool, um, or actually the tool will tell you where you are and it'll ask you if that's where you saw the bird. So you would confirm the location. Um, you would confirm the date because that obviously is important specifically for our migrants. You would tell us about how big this bird is and we're going to select that it's about a robin size. So it gives you kind of a range and I'm going fast because I'm, 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 I'm assuming that many of you are familiar with Merlin. Um, so I apologize if I'm speeding through this if you're new, but we're going to say this bird's about a robin size. You can pick up to three colors. So we're going to pick red and black for this example. And then you're going to tell the tool where you saw the bird. Um, and with pretty high accuracy, sometimes it's the first bird and sometimes it's the second, third or fourth bird, but it will give you a list of birds and you can scroll through and you can say, yes, that is what I saw or, or take a look at other birds that look similar to that bird. And yes, indeed, this was a, um, a scarlet tanager that landed and you got a glimpse of. Gorgeous bird, one of my favorite summer migrants that is very hard to spot, but I have found where they're nesting in my, in my property. So I try to seek them out every year and get a glimpse of them if I can. Merlin also has two other very cool tools. One is photo ID. So if you're fast enough, you can snap, snatch a picture and submit that. It's not as, um, as it's the rating of um, matches isn't as high as the bird ID workflow that I just walked you through, but it's still pretty high in the, in the high nineties um, or high eighties, low nineties. Um, and it'll give you options of what bird it is that you just took a picture of. And then the tool that I'm most excited to try out, especially this spring is sound ID. And what's neat about this is you can literally record the birds out your window and it will in real time tell you what bird is singing or calling. There, this has um, been developed for a, a little over 400 bird species at this time. We're still constantly expanding our numbers. It's only for North America. We're hoping in to release this for other countries in the coming years, but sound ID, fabulous. I, um, I don't uh, bird as well by sound. And so this is a cool tool that I'm learning how to ID birds by sound, very neat. And then of course, most of you are probably very familiar with eBird. It's become an incredibly important bird conservation tool. Millions and millions of observations a year um, and uh, well over half a million citizen scientists that regularly contribute to it. And a lot of those numbers do come from big events like GBBC and Global Big Day and so forth. So this has become a powerhouse um, resource for researchers. And many of you might be wondering, you know, some of the reasons or, or the uses for this particular tool. And this is an example, I'm just going to let the map run a little bit. This is, this is a status and trend map. And we have these for hundreds of species now at this point, which is really exciting. This is the ruby crown kiglet, which for those of you that get to see is mostly a migrant for us, not around super long tends to go a little bit further north for nesting and then um, you guys might get it on the coast i guess a, a little bit more and then goes further south for the winter but a beautiful little bird and you can begin to see with the amount of citizen scientists that are submitting data on sightings if we start to map that data in real time we literally know where these birds are when or where when they're most likely to be when and so this is it's going it's running through the calendar year so we have january here over to december and you can see how beautiful, not only are these maps mesmerizing to watch, but you can begin to put the pieces together of how we might manage our landscapes um, and our properties and our cities and our communities to maximize these birds in different times of the year when they are in different places and they're in need of different types of things. And this particular species is a really critical migratory species that we need to support. So. Um, all those eBird sightings aren't just cool, they're actually influencing conservation by knowing where birds are when. And we have a newish tool. It's only been around a few years called BirdCast. And we're really starting to make some headway in convincing, um, especially larger cities and larger um, regions, to make really thoughtful choices at different times of the year when birds are being forecasted um, to move through their area. And so this uses radio, radio towers, which already exist all over the United States. We're hoping to, to push into other countries, but there's a lot of um, 
uh, rules and regulations that differ in other countries. So we don't have radios for radio tower access for all countries at this point, but we do in North America and we can begin to map out. This is sort of a, um, uh, kind of a gulf, a peak time of year when birds are moving up the gulf and up to their northern um, migrating route, migrating regions, their nesting regions, and this is in May. And so if we can forecast kind of like the status and trends maps combined with this radio radar data, and we know literally when birds are taking off on their big flights, because they generally tend to take off in, in large amounts at the same time, we can begin to do um, really powerful conservation. And so we've been able to develop these peak migration maps um, to influence cities in particular. So there's a big movement called the Lights Out campaign that happens in the fall. We're starting to try and make headway in other cities around the United States as well. And we have gotten um, Dallas and Austin and various other cities in Texas to actually turn off their lights in the in the um, in those states for windows of time when birds are migrating through and so we're using this birdcast data the status and trends data from ebird to really pr uh, provide compelling reasons why we really should be making active um, changes and it's really a win-win because a lot of these these big companies benefit right they they save some energy um, during those times of the year when they have agreed and gotten on board to turn their lights off to protect our migrating birds so while all of this habitat creation is wonderful and the citizen science stuff is wonderful, there's also big policy changes and, and larger changes that can be made when we kind of pull this data together and, and work on it um, on a larger scale. So in summary, and I will be happy to field some questions. I know I threw a lot at you tonight, um, but in summary, plant natives, if you have property, if you have a porch, I have some people who have milkweed in, in plant, in potters, pots that they put on their property. Um, all of it matters, all of it counts, whatever you can in the space that you have. Um, protect those windows, um, especially during migration season, get something up there so that birds are not colliding with them, turn those lights out, and then get to know your birds. Many of you on this call probably already do know your birds, but um, get to know more and, and learn more about your migrants. Um, and if we all do this, I really truly believe, this is why I love the work at the lab, I I think each and every one of us have the, has the capacity to help bring the birds back. And I look forward to being at the lab long enough to see that that curve um, start to bend and our populations to come back. So thank you very much. And um, I'm happy to field field questions.